Hello, everyone. Greetings. Good evening. Thank you for uh, bearing with us as various technological uh, challenges were besetting us, uh, setting up live stream and uh, recording video and everything, and just getting the HDMI to work with the projector is a little bit of, a, uh, of, a, of an odyssey, but uh, we have it going now. I am Jeffrey Burleson, and I'm thrilled to be here at uh, the University of Utah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Madonna, for inviting me. Uh, this should be really fun for me and stimulating, and I hope it is for you and for everyone and anyone else who will be joining in. So um, I'm here to give uh, workshops throughout the semester, actually through three trips uh, that will uh, occur obviously now, this most of this week, and then the last week of October, and then the first week of April. And what I will be talking about is improvisation. Uh, this is an outgrowth of the course that I teach at Hunter College in Manhattan that I call Improvisation and Composition for Classical Pianists. Uh, and the concept of the course is basically to cover the history of keyboard improvisation from the earliest wellsprings that we really have of it in terms of charts that we can find that are uh, prompting uh, improvisatory actions from keyboardists uh, up to the present. So I go through the early Baroque period, uh, the high Baroque period, uh, the classical period where we mostly talk about uh, Mozart and Mozart piano concerto cadenzas, uh, the romantic period where I, I talk a lot about the, uh, some of the more chromatic and textural innovations on the pianos. We widen the color palettes. Uh, and widen the range of harmonic possibilities. And then jazz, about a third of the course is actually on jazz, uh, and particularly geared towards the keyboard uh, with, uh, again, voicings and uh, textural aspects of what jazz pianists do in different idioms. And then into um, free improvisation. By that, I really mean uh, combining seemingly disparate styles, uh, idioms of music, uh, to create your own synthesis and your own voice. Uh, so that's kind of the thrust of the course, the evolution of the course. Um, so I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about improvisation and the keyboardist in general. We have a, a small but devoted audience here, so I'd like to just find out uh, who you are. I know my esteemed colleagues over here, but uh, of the four of you, uh, how many, big reveal for the audience here, uh, how many of you are keyboardists? Okay, so three out of four uh, um, piano majors here, or yeah, okay, great. So um, how many of you have done some improvisation? Okay, so yeah, so two sort of enthusiastic, one kind of in, in, in one now. It's interesting, that's something that is fascinating to consider, the history of our tribe as keyboardists, as so-called classical keyboardists. So if you were a keyboardist uh, in the earliest days of the instrument, and certainly in the Baroque era, once we get to around 1600, when we start having a lot more documentation around then, of what keyboardists did. Before that, it starts getting a little murky. But with perform regard to performance practice and everything, we start understanding what keyboardists do. And um, everybody improvised. If you were a keyboardist in the Baroque era and you did not improvise, you didn't work. It was not, you could not just uh, read the notes on the page and, and um, make sure that all the rhythms and uh, the rhythms and the notes all happen in the right places, and if you're a harpsichordist, you didn't have to think about dynamics so much, of course, uh, since that wasn't possible. So we all improvised back then, uh, and none of us were playing piano yet because it hadn't been invented. So it comes around in the mid-18th century. And in the high baroque, uh, um, middle to high baroque, everybody's reading figured bass, uh, 
if you're a keyboardist, so that is uh, like sort of the inversion of a jazz chart, where in a jazz chart you have chord symbols and a melody, and figured bass you have a bass line and numbers underneath the bass notes that are basically telling you what harmonies to play, and you fill out the texture on top of that. Um, and so much music is, was written that way, and probably some stuff that you play by composers like Handel that were actually, where most of the stuff you're playing was actually realized by somebody else, like the specific rhythms and voicings were realized by someone else, usually some 19th century dude who lived long after Handel. If you've ever seen a score that has the bass, has this, these bass parts, like something from a Handel oratorio or something, and you see the upper notes in little note heads, have you ever seen that in scores? Yeah. That means that somebody else realized the part because the whole thing was originally figured based and you were supposed to improvise, you know, all that stuff. So that happens. When we get into the classical era, uh, everybody is still improvising. We're transitioning to the piano. Um, harpsichords get bigger and bigger, but that model just eventually dissolves at least for a while before the harpsichord gets revived. And a composer like Mozart is always improvising. He improvises all the cadenzas to his own concerti, uh, and um, which is something I do, which is something more and more keyboardists are doing now. We have these Mozart concerti that are standard that nobody has written a cadenza for. I mean, well, that Mozart never wrote a cadenza for, rather. And lots of other composers have written cadenzas for. Um, and so we don't necessarily know what he's done. We even have Mozart concerti. I'm going to be using the C minor concerto as an example, one of two that he wrote uh, in a minor key. The C minor concerto, especially in the first movement, it's thought that he's missing a lot of notes, even in the regular solo part. That solo part is very thin in a lot of places, the writing. So when I played that piece, not just in the cadenza, I've added stuff to the first movement of the concerto, just even in the body of the work. Because it was kind of a chart, it was just something, what we have is something that he used to play himself, not something that ended up being thrown into publication. In the 19th century, everybody improvises. Still, um, we have uh, rapturous descriptions of how Beethoven improvised and how Liszt improvised and so forth and so on. Um, sometimes on themes just shouted out from the audience. Um, so when does it start to dissolve? It does start to dissolve a little bit uh, as uh, more and more as piano music gets more and more and more difficult. But it really seems to start to dissolve for pianists uh, when competitions start becoming very, very big things in the mid-19th century, mid-20th century, rather. You have new competitions like the Queen Elizabeth of Belgium competition, which I think started in 1956. And then many of us became specialists, uh, where we had to dig into so much virtuosic music uh, and thus perhaps leave improvisation behind so that we could bring you know, two concerti and three recital programs and a piano quintet to a competition. Um, so it goes away for piano. It never went away for harpsichord. Any working harpsichordist has to improvise now. And it never went away for organists. So if you're an organ major and um, you're entering an organ competition now in Europe, there is usually an improvisation round still where they will give you a theme 20 minutes before you're supposed to improvise on. So you can sort of mull it over, and then there's an improvisation. Wouldn't it be weird if the Van Cliver had an improvisation round or the Tchaikovsky? I think it would be amazing. The results would be possibly thrown into complete disarray. Yes, I'm, I'm on board with that. That would be really, really something. In any case, this whole world of classical, quote unquote, classical pianists learning how to improvise and coming back to improvisation, fortunately, is, is growing again. And so this is what, and I should set my display to 
never see. How long does it take to come back? So I was just about to show you something. Of course, <laughs> of course that's going to happen. I'm going to turn off the sleep, but um, I need to get the display back, of course. It's funny because it's still showing the same ratio that it's just showing. display up. There we go. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. I missed the light bulb. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, yeah no, it's, I, haven't, I haven't done it this whole lesson. Yeah. So, um, oh, that's just on the iPad. Anyway, let's get out of the 21st century and go back to the 16th century. So, what do we start with uh, what's the gateway for, for all of this? So going back to the early Baroque, uh, there is a guy named Louis Couperin. So Couperin is a French Baroque composer uh, and um, an early Baroque composer. He comes from an illustrious uh, family of, of Baroque keyboardists, organists. Uh, they all played in the same church in Paris for, for some time. Uh, his, um, we play some of his music even as pianist. Not Louis Couperin, but his nephew, Francois Couperin, who's of the next generation. Uh, Louis is not played, played rarely by pianist, uh, played more by harpsichordist. So um, he uh, didn't invent this genre, but he, um, I think, helped make it famous and helped uh, codify it. The genre of the unmeasured prelude. So, as you can see, this is, uh, emanates from the 17th century, and as you will see, this absolutely requires improvisation. So, here in modern script is what a Louis Couperin unmeasured prelude looks like. Right? It looks like a late 20th century or early 21st century open form. 
composition, right? It doesn't look like something that is emanates from uh, this time. And in the original manuscript, you have these slurs, you have these sort of lines that I think are supposed to show duration of the longer bass notes uh, through the form and everything. So what do we see here? And what do we do with this? So if I just play this as a um, just as written on the screen here, more or less. And I'm going to do a very fast chord and note equals because otherwise we'll, you know, I'll do, it'll be 9 o'clock by the time I get to the end of even these three systems.
So now I'm not trying to sort of harmonize things right off the cuff, but I'm trying to create something expressive from this from these melodic shapes. Um, taking my time. Uh, one really good trick to keep employing when you're practicing improvisation, uh, especially if here's another concept that's good to introduce at this moment: uh, rhapsodic versus rhythmic improvisation. Rhapsodic improvisation is almost always easy, especially if you're playing solo, because you get to decide when you're going to change the chord, when you're going to go on to the next note, and you can always let your brain and your fingers be ahead of where you are. So that's a benefit of that, and it's um, a wonderful tool that way. So that's what I was doing here. Everything was very rhapsodic and flourishy. It didn't have a definite beat to it, so to speak, right? It's not um, uh, implying any kind of tapas or anything. So that um, is, if you just let your mind be ahead of where you're playing, and then also relax. Don't get worried about, oh, what if it's boring? Maybe I shouldn't stay. Maybe I've got to play more notes. That is a very, when you're first starting to improvise, that's also a very easy trap to fall into. Um, um, you know, what if my conception is boring or I've got to move on and do something more interesting? Let the stillness and the space, just the, I, I, just the sound of the decay on the instrument, keep your mind ahead of where you're playing. And that, those are good, um, philosophical approaches to use when you're practicing improvisation, especially when you're first starting out. Start off with rhapsodic improvisation. You don't have to change the chord. I've got to change it four beats later, and then two beats later, I have to change the chord. So that's the idea. So what am I doing here? Sometimes I'm arpeggiating, but only as far as I feel comfortable. I will add um, passing tones and neighbor tones. So just, just that. I like that E flat going to F sharp. That sounds very cool and dark, right? Sort of expanded double neighbor. And it's got that sort of torturous thing, you know. Going down. So, okay, so what's that? What's that interval class? Yeah, B flat is that actually diminished. Diminished fourth. Yeah, it's a nasty little interval. So very, very disorienting, very chromatic. So I just... So just throwing in some passing tones and changing the rhythm a little bit can, can help. And you can stop at any of these notes. So this is the this is such a great gateway drug for improvisation. Volunteers, I think since there are all like so few of you here, everybody gets to play. It's a beautiful part of this. So let's let's everybody get their feet wet with this. Who would like to go first? Okay. Who should go first? Okay. Awesome. Unless somebody else wants to go first, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> Check the tone, yeah. Cool. And uh, what's your name? Ian. Ian, us. Oh. oh no. So much for. Oh no. So, so much. Lisa well, we came back, but let's just re briefly see if we can. Right, well, it's, it's not going to allow me to, it, it'll give you one hour. Joe's screensaver after, okay. 
Unchecking it, do you think that did it? I think so. Yeah. Okay, let's try. Yeah, and check the box. Okay, um, do with this what you will, and go as far as you like. And, and I'll say one other thing, and this is a nice thing to do when you're practicing, say, improvising something. Um, create an ending for it. Just something that sounds like an ending. Make it sound like a convincing ending. Throw in a cadence at the, when, whenever you feel like stopping, throw in a cadence. Okay. It's a good thing also to practice. And that one.
So I, I loved lots of things that you did. Uh, I'm going to give you some suggestions. I thought that it, it did get more defined as it went along, but of course you're getting your feet wet. The first few minutes of any performance can be tough. One thing that we have to remember to do as improvisers um, is uh, execution of all of the elements. One of the first things that doesn't work if you don't do a lot of improvisation uh, is pedaling. So we're not thinking of the pedal, or we're not, we're not convinced of the quality of what we're improvising. And anytime we're not convinced about the quality of something we're playing, we know we tend to hide behind the pedal with a little bit of a wet foot sometimes anyway, sometimes in music that we haven't completely learned yet, completely written out in music. So we do know that this is Baroque music, and I'm not saying that means don't use any pedal on it whatsoever, but if you want to pedal cleanly, when you know you're changing harmonies and you're changing the basic harmony, try to do a, you know, a clean, clean pedal change. Uh, we know in this style that um, everything is very, on the harpsichord, everything is very, very transparent, what could come out. But we can still be textural. And so there are places where you play a more softly diffuse um, arpeggio, and you have the pedal down, and it was it's like a G minor arpeggio or something. And to me, that completely works uh, in this. Um, there were just more places, especially as you were playing lower on the instrument, uh, where things got a little bit muddy, and you're going in conjunct motion, right? If you're doing more scalar stuff, uh, you don't want to be using too much pedal, or you want to be fluttering at your doing more half pedal. So we need to think about the execution, not just the stuff that we're making up, you know, when we, when we go through it. But I really like what you're doing yeah, very, very much. Uh, so, so thank you, yes. Oh yeah, give me some hands. Other people are gonna come up. Before, before our next uh, victim, or I should say hero, it comes up, I wanna talk about some of the peculiar note choices that people still talk about with these manuscripts. They are very bizarre. Uh, and we have to remember that when we, when we go back to the, um, the early Baroque period and before, there are composers that use some very strange dissonances. You know, uh, uh, you all get to Gisualdo, this medieval composer, anybody? Mm -hmm. Check him out. Yeah, Gisualdo is, is awesome. He has music. Hmm? G E S U A L D O. I'm still waiting for a biopic of Gisualdo because he, uh, uh, he was also a murderer. He killed his wife's lover and all this stuff. And so he had a kind of interesting life, too. Um, yeah, kind of a dark dude. Uh, but he wrote music that there are passages in his music that um, are very similar to Wagner's chromaticism, which is, you know, 600 years old. Um, and so we get music from this time, and we're not sure sometimes uh, what is meant. Like this. This funny line here that's at the top of the screen. So it's like a Doppler effect ambulance or something. Um, so yeah, so what does this what does this mean? You know? It's um, it's definitely subject to uh, interpretation. Uh, a, a trill that's a bizarre interval to trill. I don't think we've ever heard anything like that in Baroque, a perfect fifth going, going to a diminished fifth like that. So bizarre. Um, and even some, you know. You know, it sounds like uh, mid 
20th century Aaron Copeland, you know, pandiatonic music or something. Um, so, um, so just releasing the D in time would make it, you know, more idiomatic. But it's stuff to stuff we have to think about um, a little bit. Next hero, who wants to improvise next? The beautiful thing about having an intimate crowd is that everybody gets to try these try these numbers. So I want to introduce one other concept, actually, before you uh, play. Um, and I just want to demonstrate something about this. So, so I mentioned this before, sort of do an additive thing. So we're improvising in this very rhapsodically. This is something I did in the jazz class earlier. But this, you can also take this and improvise very rhythmically on it. <laughs> And, and well executed. Then you got a little lower, 
And then there was like a, you know, a long pedal, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's it's a very easy trap to fall into. So if we keep thinking about it, it will get um, easier. When we're improvising in the lower part of the piano, just as when we're playing completely written music down there, we know we have to be more and more careful uh, with the pedals. Things get muddier and less, less distinct, yeah. you know, yeah. So uh, that's definitely something to, you know, to, to keep working on, um, for sure. Um, and Frank, you know, just the act of playing through something like this um, every day and experimenting with it, uh, by the, you could put something like this on a recital, you know, on a standard recital and, and uh, improvise on it. And just that you've done it a lot means that you will have built this bag of tricks, this arsenal of different ideas, you know, that you can use. So that's something I would also encourage. Um, so, uh, hey, what's your name? Susanna. Susanna, great name, Susanna. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to say that a new thing each time uh, to this. So uh, the rhythmic thing, uh, just introduce out. Now let's try occasionally playing more than one note at a time uh, in the right hand. So the uh, default for this, what, what intervals do you think are the defaults? Uh, if you're just going to improvise intervals. Well, I guess there is. Thirds and sixths. Thirds and the yes and the uh, uh, inversion of the third and the sixth, right? Because they're the part triadic intervals. Um, if you were if you were not in the Baroque and you still wanted to do something tonal modal or something, you could do fourths or fifths too. But then you but then you're in a very different idiom. That's obviously not in tonal, but that's a very kind of modal thing. But parallel fourths and obviously parallel fifths are not going to sound idiomatic to this, but if you're
sounded like a composition. Your phrasing was gorgeous. Really, very, very touching. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I like, you did a thing that was different than what anybody else has done so far. You kind of were creating a dialogue between the, a, a bass line and a troubled line. And so, uh, melody-based relationships, right? So, so far, we hadn't really heard anybody uh, create something that sounded like an independent bass line for very long, but especially at the end, you had that going on. That was really nice, and it was just instinctive. But one wonderful thing, uh, glorious thing about improvisation is you surprise yourself sometimes on your on your best days. Like, how do I think of that? Well, it's good to record yourself a lot doing it because you know you hate to forget things. That, uh, unfortunately, we have this documentation here. So, uh, really great. Um, so, uh, the only things I miss, I didn't really hear anything rhythmic. Yeah. So, um, take a passage in this, any passage, start anywhere, and just play something rhythmic, even just for a few seconds. Something where we can feel a definite pulse. cheap stuff that the ball be does. Sometimes just taking 
something like that, and just playing just parallel thirds, just with the notes that you see, um, can break the ice with something like that. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So, we have one more non-keyboardist, I'm guessing. Uh, what do you play? I play saxophone and piano. Cool. Well, what's your uh, piano background? Um, piano? You want to come up and mess around a little bit? Yeah, So I'm not going to prescribe anything. Just do anything you want to do. Is the 
sound of the sonority in the instrument decaying, right? Whatever it is. And so that's a really great thing, you know, to use uh, as well. And it's what you played is something that sounded much more like a composition or improvisation from um, our own town. So uh, tell me your name. I'm Zane. Zane, great to meet you, Zane. Bravo. <laughs> so I'll take off from that a, a, a little bit. And um, when you go through something like this or anything you're improvising on, think about register. If you're going to improvise, if you want to explore what you can do outside of the Baroque period, so to speak. So great, uh, fantastic. So uh, any questions or thoughts about Louis Couperin or this genre or before we move on to the later book? Okay, so uh, great, so we're gonna do that now. We're gonna move on to um, the world of, of Bach, basically, um, the high Baroque, uh, and as I mentioned in the jazz class today, Bach in particular, uh, good old JS, uh, is a hugely influential figure in jazz, period. Um, there are, there's a whole history of Bach's music uh, being in the 20th century, simply being swung uh, and sometimes reharmonized, but not always. And if you take a Lots of works of Bach and just do it in a, a swing rhythm. Um, it can often sound uh, like jazz without almost changing anything else. And that has a lot to do with the angularity. Sometimes of the lines are very similar to uh, Bach lines, bebop lines, you know, sometimes. So that's one uh, element, one combination here. But I also wanted to 
I actually want to spend a fairly good amount of time on Bach, longer than with Louis Cooper and probably should make sense uh, a little bit. Um, so th there's a lot more to improvising in Bach, thinking about Bach than just uh, uh, just the jazz realm by any stretch of the imagination. So to get you thinking forward, to get you thinking ahead, uh, in the final stretch here in April when I come back, uh, the idea there is for um, you to have created something that will be in a final concert, and then we'll have some dress rehearsals and master classes, and we'll um, uh, work with you on honing it and expanding it or something like that early on, and maybe at the end of that week, uh, the final concert. But as, we're, as I'm going through this this week uh, and then the last week of October, think about what you would like to do as a final project stylistically, because I'll be covering all these different things, and by the time I get to the end of October, you'll have a lot of choices, you know, as we'll get up to the present. And you might want to combine and juxtapose, you know, different styles as well. So when I, when I teach this course, there's always a final concert, and there are people that will do something with Louis Cooper, there are people that will do something with jazz, uh, there are uh, people that will um, combine uh, WC and trance music and Charlie Parker, you know, there's just sort of any kinds of juxtapositions or stylistic um, constructs you can think of. So, Many of us already improvise on Bach. We are all improvisers, even if you thought you haven't improvised before, because we're all, we're all called interpreters, right? So we interpret uh, this music. There's not an objectively perfect way to play it, so we have to make choices. Uh, and even if we're conventionally playing Bach or Baroque music, a lot of classical musicians who normally wouldn't consider themselves improvisers sort of improvise just by deciding what ornaments to put into something or to leave out. Um, so in this uh, Dropbox, I wanted to show you some resources uh, that I have um, in all of this. Uh, and a vast quantity of materials here. See if I can find this handout. So this is actually from, and since we all teach me, and it's good to talk about resources uh, as well. Uh, this is from um, Willard Palmer's Alfred edition of uh, the Bach Short Preludes, uh, which uh, I use to teach uh, students uh, quite a bit. Uh, it's interesting to think about the whole litany of Bach, first of all, because we can improvise on you know, all of this music. Uh, so what, are, what volume do we find the easiest Bach pieces in? It's a book. It's a little book. Little is in the title. I'm not going to lie, I have no idea. Oh, that's okay. The, it's not only the pianist who's just finished. The so-called little notebook for Anna Magdalena Bach. Right? So that's where we all learn this. <laughs> And then we get there are several sets of Kleine Preludien or Little Preludes uh, that are a little bit harder than that. Um, and then there are the two part inventions, and then the three part inventions or symphonias, and then there's the prelude and fugue. And Bach, I, are you aware that he, with some of this music, actually cataloged them and sort of told us explicitly which pieces he thought were harder than other pieces? Yeah, he called them. Clavier Ubelman, almost so many of the things he wrote, including very difficult things, Clavier Ubelman are, are keyboard exercises uh, in more and more complicated volumes, actually going up through the preludes and fugues and the Goldberg variations and everything. In any case, um, 
it's good to know what all these symbols mean um, in Bach, and some of us don't. And some really great students I have that play tons of music and play tons of Bach don't necessarily know what all these symbols mean and what all the different kinds of ornamentation we can use are. So that's a pretty fundamental um, improvisational thing we should know. So this resource is here. Uh, it's really well put together uh, by Palmer, and it's all extrapolated from uh, the uh, CPE box, Essay on the True Art of Keyboard Playing. Um, if you're a dedicated pianist, you should have this book in your library. It's really the reason that we know um, what CPE box dad meant um, with all of these markings and so forth. And this is a really nice kind of simplified, well, not really simplified, but nice cold version of what's also like a very long book. It doesn't just talk about ornamentation, it talks about style, a lot of different things. Really worth going through. <coughs> so I'm not going to go through all of these. So I'm going to try here, let me just give you a moment. Jet lag, etc. Um, so we have the uh, appoggiatura, where we have to remember that when we see sometimes these little note heads going to a larger note head, we have to make sure that there's not a slash through it. If there's a slash through that little note, then it's a grace note. If there's not a slash through it, it's an appoggiatura. So that means we have to lean on the first note. It's usually translated into a rhythm that's half the rhythm of the, uh, the principal note value that's given. So you have like an eighth note going to a letter B here. For example, a quarter note, that will translate into two eighth notes. What does, what does a pagiatura mean? something that's leaned on. And so that is presenting the impetus. When you see something like that, you should actually lean on the first note. You should put a tenuto on the first note. Like for this note, it's an expressive note. Um, and um, it's meant to be emphasized more. So on the harpsichord, you couldn't play it louder, but you played it a little bit longer, you know, to compensate for that. So you rhythmically messed around with things on the harpsichord much, much more than you did on the piano because you couldn't use dynamics. So when you see that kind of indication, play it expressively too. It's not just a kind of weird, well, why do you do that? It's because of the expressive idea. So then we have the turn for the gruppetto. It almost looks literally like that. Um, sometimes you start on the principal note, go up. Back down to the principal note, back down, and then up to the principal note again. So you could start and see sometimes when you see that uh, that symbol, um, that's sort of a sideways scroll. The mordent, which comes from mordere to bite. Um, So there's an attitudinal aspect of it. There's an emotive aspect of it, like the expressiveness of an appoggiatura or the bite of a mordant. You don't play a mordant slowly. You sort of crunch it together. Um, and I bring this up a lot because one of the exercises that I'm going to go into with, with um, some of the Bach music we're going to look at is just improvising your own Ornamentation. The trill we know, obviously, uh, we get a trill that's a little bit of a squiggle here, sometimes TR, uh, later added as an abbreviation, uh, but the squiggle is older. A longer squiggle will mean more repetitions of the trill, basically. 
I don't think you have to necessarily worry about the rhythm, but sometimes we get, there's the measured trill, um, as well as the unmeasured trill. So sometimes a trill will be, uh, Rhythmic, and sometimes it won't be rhythmic. Sort of find an example here that just occurred to me. Big things. Move slower than my pad. something that is very familiar to all of us, a couple of things. Sorry, my brain is a little jet lag is hitting me intermittently. Too much material up front of this. Well, I don't think I need to put this particular thing on the screen necessarily. Do I have? Oh, good. Edgy Rome. Saves, it, saves the day.
Okay, so we all know this. For example, right? So uh, I mentioned in the uh, jazz class that maybe not in here that that uh, we've only been looking at preludes so far. Uh, what a prelude is, we understand that a prelude is something that's played before uh, something else, right? That's the literally the term, but what it was used for, it was always improvised. Preludes were always improvised in the first, I don't know, maybe 100 years of their existence. Um, they were meant to be something that where the, the keyboardist could test out all registers of the key. And that's often why preludes sometimes cover a large uh, range of the keyboard. This one doesn't. Um, and it's a difficult approach that Bach uses, not just in this piece, but quite a few pieces. So this is you know, quite, quite well known. Yeah. Too many notes, so to speak. 
Uh, but it, it, uh, it's part of the, that world, you know, the sort of jangly harpsichord that's playing all the time, uh, that's constantly making metallic sounds. And so that's often why it was, why it was used, because the harpsichord in a continuo setting, an ensemble setting, is there sometimes just to create uh, this kind of constant timbre with the harmony that all is sounding. So that's what one would do often with a, uh, a prelude like this. Uh, back in the day, if you saw it, it's a little bit like Louis Couperin's Unmeasured Prelude, except everything is written out rhythmically, but there's absolutely no variety in the texture whatsoever. Right? So we get that a lot in Bach preludes. Right, so here, here's another one. How many of you played this one? Uh, but you probably must. There you go. <laughs> but but ben, thank you for yeah, being uh, <laughs> emphatic in your response. But this said, uh, you you all. <laughs> So it's another pattern prelude. There are a lot of pattern preludes in Bach. Look through the, these are maybe the two most famous ones, but look through the well-tempered clavier, look at the little preludes. They are great formats for uh, improvisation. This one is, I noted in uh, the class, a jazz class this morning, uh, is, has been used uh, in a jazz context, not only just by swinging it, but by uh, changing some of the voicings, but still making it recognizable. <laughs> It 
fixing the handwheel today. Yeah, it's all right. It's this minor curves over and over and over. So it just uh, often when you get to the, this is kind of cheap, but we should know the cheap effective things too. Like the easiest thing, I have to think more about. <laughs> and it's good to go back into the comfort zone a little bit. So there's a, a jazz scale. It's um, called the diminished seventh scale in jazz, called the, um, called the uh, octatonic scale in the classical world. That's the scale you can use with the uh, diminished seventh chord. It alternates whole steps and half steps. Jazz when I get to the diminished seventh chord. Um, but um, we'll get back to that. But the octatonic scale is a good, just you're alternating half steps and whole steps. It's easy to find the scale. Um, and again, we'll talk about more about that when we get into the jazz uh, section of the course as well. So, um, yeah, so this stuff is really cool. Let's see where we are time wise. Okay. Um, a little bit of time there. The, um, a lot of the repertoire that I find the most, uh, the most user-friendly, the most approachable uh, right away uh, for improvisation and Bach, to have a Bach piece in front of you and feel kind of comfortable with the idea of improvising on it, are these so-called little preludes. Um, the six little preludes and the 12 little preludes. And I have a lot of these on the Dropbox link um, to the materials for this class uh, that you can use. And so I want to briefly explore some of those. And in the next class, um, I'm going to tomorrow's class, uh, I'm going to ask everybody to plan to improvise on them a little bit as well. Um, so let me get back to this. Fortunately, I know where all of these are. for a lot of really early Bach stuff is really great. I like how he has the, uh, all the stuff that's not Bach in gray here, the editorial suggestions, and the stuff that is Bach is in black. Uh, and he decodes some of the ornaments for you and everything. Bach obviously didn't write Kanmoto, uh, Cordenote equals 120 to 138, and uh, Palmer's very, you know, upfront about this. Uh, so, um, this is a little bit more twisty, uh, and you know, what's really funny about these is I never played any of these when I was studying piano. I played Anna Magdalena Bach stuff and I went straight to two-part adventures, and I skipped these entirely. 
And I, I love discovering them years later, and I thought, why did I ever play these? These are really cool, and they're a very cool way station in between the little Minuet and G um, and the uh, two-part inventions. And if you have um, you know, late elementary level students that are just starting to get into early intermediate, these are really cool pieces and often very attractive uh, to them. There's a sort of a, a nice immediacy about a lot of them. So this one has a kind of angularity that we associate with Bach sometimes, with things changing direction all the time. Way, way down, 
you know, slow it way, way down so you've got space to do what you like, want to do, that you feel confident enough and play it like music. Still play it like music. Um, it's that malleability of Bach. You can play it really fast, slow it down. It still sounds amazing. It's not contingent on, um, on so much. I'm, I'm a huge listener and I love list. I play a lot of list. One of the reasons I, there are two reasons I decided to be, I had to be a pianist. I heard the Liszt Piano Sonata. I heard both these pieces when I was 13, 14. I heard the Liszt Piano Sonata, and I heard Ravel's Gaspar Dillon. And I saw, I have to do this seriously now because I want to play those two pieces, and if I don't take this seriously, I'll never play those two pieces. Those are the two pieces that, that I've got to do this now. I love the Liszt. There's a great comment that's made about this. If you play Bach badly, you still recognize it as great music. If you play Liszt badly, even his best stuff, it can really sound like trash. And that's not just any reflection on quality, it's like how the music is constructed. There's such a purity to this kind of music. And it's what's really lovely about it is you can play it at any tempo. And if you add just enough, it will still sound really satisfying. Um, so slow things way down, especially Bach. And then it will allow you to feel comfortable to put things in without your brain exploding, basically. So, uh, so that's another approach, ornamentation, passing the neighbor tones. Um, Ciphering something every day, that's what you do to be a better cipher. And I 
try not to cheat. And so I try to sight read it. Sometimes I'm sight reading, I'm trying to sight read something in tempo. Sometimes if it's too complicated, I'll slow it way down. But once I start it, I'll stop. And I try to plug in as many of the right notes into the right rhythm as possible. Sight reading as if I'm sight reading with another musician. I can't add an extra B. And it may not be something long. But because I've been doing that for many years, it's helped me to be a better sight reader. So I do that for the first 10, 15 minutes of my practice each day. It's a great warm up to do to both those things. So that is, I'm sort of coming back. So yeah, that's a really fantastic prelude. Nothing before was it just sort of a pure solo. Like it didn't even make any sense why that happened. Actually, we don't even know how this started working because we were just, we threw up our hands and then all of a sudden after 45 minutes, it was something working. So I've got the, the Mac, the improvisation, <laughs> the blank Mac OS screen, which never makes any sense when you project in. Well, we can go back to display. Maybe I have to do the. Uh, let me know if anything changes up there. Somehow. Settings, main display, mirror for unknown display. Yeah, it just defaults it. That's why. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, time to briefly look up one more. And we'll, we'll call it in. Um, and so you see, all all of these are in the. Is 
as long as you don't see any accidentals, and you, you know that you can stick to the key uh, that is being presented to you, then nothing is going to sound horribly discordant. <laughs> sequences of simple arpeggiated sequences. We've talked a little bit about those uh, today. But this is a great example of something we learn in counterpoint class on top of the page. That's a really good question, um, and so it's something I was planning to bring up um, kind of throughout the course. The big picture is that uh, there's no such thing as pure improvisation, um, and there's or there's hardly any such thing. There's hardly any such thing as uh, pure composition that has no improvisation as any part of the creative process. Uh, it's a continuum. And that's what I call the sort of lecture, the improvisation composition continuum. So extreme improvisation would be something that's stochastic, random, like has no rules whatsoever. You never use any patterning, any kinds of patterns that you've ever used before. It might sound completely chaotic in a way. Uh, extreme, uh, well, the best example of extreme um, premedicated composition would be uh, something that at least the Roger Miles wrote, the original Roger Miles, of course. So uh, he was in residence at Holy Cross College for a year when I was teaching there. Um, and he wrote a big piece for uh, Philip Larkin that was premiered there about an hour long. Oh, and Steve Schick, his uh, percussion mm -hmm. voice. Uh, and it was, you know, amazing. Um, <laughs> but he gave, he was asked to give a little uh, 
little pre-concert preamble, you know. Uh, and he talked for longer than the piece. <laughs> so it's like 75 minutes of talk. But the first sentence was, well, I would like you to know that before I write any piece of music, I usually take at least a year of formulating pre-compositional processes, processes, before I write a note of music. I'm paraphrasing just a little bit, but this is kind of what he said. So that's a, a good example of extreme premeditation in the act of creation, right? So these are extremes. We're, we're usually somewhere in the middle. So, and say the jazz um, that I play, um, so I mean, you have a chord progression, so you have something that's, that's fixed. But if, if I'm doing something that's sort of free, so for example, there's uh, uh, one of my groups, the Dave Sanford Big Band, uh, there are a couple pieces I do where I just have to play like a big soul for the desire at the beginning or end. Nobody else is playing. And I can do whatever I want to, which, which is really fun. Um, so what do I do in those cases? Well, I think about the, I practice improvising on the material in the piece, the material that I find intriguing in the piece. Um, and it's like sometimes it's a motive, a couple of motives, or a certain chord progression or something. I practice doing that. Sometimes just sticking with the same motive very obsessively. So there's this one piece called the Three Card Molly. <laughs> sequence and go all over the place with it. So that's my practice. Um, and then I, uh, when, it, when it comes up, I found that usually like a few minutes before I think of a way to start it. And that that's all I got. And then whatever I do after that, I don't know what I'm going to do. As these things build, as you do them, as I do them more, and I know a lot of other people with that kind of improvisation, um, had a similar uh, trajectory with the growth of it. At one point, I found a um, I, I was doing something that I liked so much that I decided I had to keep it in every time I improvised. And so that happens, you know, too, uh, with these with these kind of pieces. Um, uh, so uh, there's this. Uh, one, that's another motive in it, and I found myself
Well, great. Well, thanks so much. Sorry you just caught this at the very end of the, of the day. We're doing this for a couple of hours. Yeah. There's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow, 7 to 9 o'clock.